Hi everyone and welcome back to Foundations Lesson 5. Today we're going to be talking about how to connect with God. What does that mean? What does that look like? What do I do? What do we do? And so I want to talk about that. And I hope you've been going through your Foundations book and uh, a little bit, there's a little saying that goes by the inches a cinch, by the yard it's hard. So I always encourage everybody to do a little bit a day, do one little, one little session, a se section a day, and before you know it, you'll have all, all 12 chapters done. So I, I trust and pray this has been a good resource for you. It'll really help you to learn about the Word of God, where things are, where Scripture is in the Bible. So I hope that helps. Uh, but today I want to talk about <clears throat> what does it mean to connect with God? How do we connect with God? There's only one object that's worthy of our devotion. Only one thing that will last for eternity. And that's Jesus. So every day we want to connect with Jesus. When we do that, we we're connecting with God through the word, through prayer. You know what we're doing? We're actually connecting with the eternal. Isn't that amazing? Every time we open up the word, it's the eternal words of God. We're connecting with an eternal being, which is incredible. And I love the Bible says, it says here in Isaiah 40 verse eight, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word, the word of our God stands forever. Our devotion to God is really a matter of life and death. Like I talked about in the, in the last lesson, that it's important for us to connect with God because when we read the word of God and we pray, God begins to deal with us and we, learn, and we learn how to listen to the inner voice of the spirit, the Holy Spirit. He helps us when we're dealing with flesh, flesh things, our flesh. And so it's really, it really is a matter of life and death. And it reminds me of a story I read years ago about a lady that was on the Titanic. The Titanic. It was unfortunate what happened back in 1912. But the story goes like this. There was this very wealthy lady and the Titanic hit the iceberg and it was going down and everybody was rushing to the lifeboats and they were rushing, they were trying to get all the women on board. And so she gets on the lifeboat. She realizes, oh my Lord, I got to go run back to my room. She was in this very luxurious, she had a very luxurious state room. So she gets off, she gets out of the lifeboat quickly. She runs back to her room and she goes back to her chest of drawer where she has all of her diamonds, her necklaces and all this. And she's pushing them all aside and she grabs three oranges. She doesn't grab the necklaces, the diamonds, the jewelry, but she grabs three oranges and rushes back to the lifeboat and she was saved. Now here's the moral of the story. She couldn't eat those diamonds. She knew that it was a matter of life and death. And there was only one thing she thought that was going to help sustain her through the, for the journey. They didn't know how, when, how long they were going to be on the boat. But she grabbed those three oranges. Because in that moment, the jewelry didn't matter. The diamonds didn't matter. What mattered was her sustenance. And so that's the way it is with us. Every day, we, when we connect with God, we're grabbing the three oranges, if you will. We're grabbing a hold of the scripture and the word of God. And we're praying, we're connecting with an eternal being that will sustain us on a daily basis. So why should I connect with God? Why should we connect with God? Uh, again, I have very exhaustive lessons on this. You can go to the YouTube uh, URL and you find in the beginning of the book, I think it's Church of the churchoftheking.com slash foundations. And you can find all 12 of these lessons there. And they're more exhaustive, more expansive. And I have all the scriptures there. But I'm just giving you the overview here. So why should I connect with God? Well, we want to love him. I mean, for those of you that are married, you probably remember the early days in your dating, courting relationship with your spouse. You would probably write love letters and you wanted to get with her or him as much as possible. Why? You wanted to connect. You wanted to be close because you loved each other. The same thing with God. God has written a us a love letter a long time ago. And every day when we read the Bible, it's a love letter to us. And when we do that, it makes us feel close. We get close to God. It's another, another reason why we should connect with him because we want to talk with him. Remember Adam and Eve? We talked about Adam and Eve. They talked with God. And they spoke with God in the cool of the day in the Garden of Eden. So it gives us the opportunity to talk with God and to pray. Also, not just to talk. You need to take time to listen. We want to listen. What is, what is the Lord speaking to us? When we read the scripture, when we read the word of God and something lifts off the page, we go like, oh, wow, I think that's for me 
today, right now. That's the Holy Spirit. And so we want to listen. What is he saying to us? Also, we want to do it to cleanse. When we read the word of God, it cleanses us. When we connect with God and we listen to his voice, there's a cleansing that takes place. The washing of the, wa- uh, washing of the water by the word of God, the Bible says. And also, we do it to grow. We want to grow. We want to connect with God so we can grow. We can become mature. We want to grow up in Christ. We don't want to be a baby Christian, Christian you know, forever. It reminds me, I just saw this story. Uh, there was that, that the story goes like this. It's a shame when we get to be an older Christian. You don't want to be an older Christian where you have to part the whiskers to put the bottle in. In other words, there's still just something on just learning the little, the baby principles of Christ, they never really grew up. In other words, they're still living a lot of their flesh, okay? All right, now, so what are some of the devotional practices that we see in Scripture? And Matthew chapter 6 gives us a, a snapshot of just a few of those, which, and these are really, really important though. And it's interesting how they're all combined together. And in Matthew chapter 6 is where we find the famous the Lord's Prayer. Most of you probably know that prayer. You grew up reciting that prayer. Your parents, your grandparents reciting that prayer. You hear it all the time on TVs and movies and so forth. And so it's, it's the famous Lord's Prayer. But in that, surrounded in that, there's other things that, that, were being, uh, that Matthew was bringing out uh, in the context of, of chapter 6. So here, here's four basic uh, devotional practices. There's giving, because the Bible says when you give, not if you give, when you give. Pray, when you pray, not if you pray. Fast, when you fast, not if you fast. Okay, these are things that are, these are expectations uh, as, in the Christian life that relate to, are, these are our devotional practices. Why, why do we do this? Because we love, we're so thankful and grateful what Christ has done in our life. This is a response to that, Okay. And then the word, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first God. And that's the word. So I want to unpack uh, these four devotional practices. Now, let's talk about prayer first, okay? And I love, I'm going to go back to the Old Testament in the book of Daniel. Daniel is in the lion's den, okay? Remember those story? Maybe when you were growing up in church, if you grew up in church, you heard that story of Daniel when he was thrown into the lion's den and the angel saved him, shut up the mouth of the lion, the Bible says. But it's interesting about Daniel. He had an amazing prayer life. He was so disciplined. And that's why God honored him, quite honestly. It was pretty amazing. He was a young Hebrew boy, and he was exported all the way to Babylon way back in the day. And Nebuchadnezzar was the great king at that point over Babylon. And he had some guys, some of his courtiers around him, some of his peers, that didn't like him. And they were trying to do everything because God said they saw God's hand and favor on his life. Because he connected with God every day. You you start connecting with God every day, there's going to be something different about you. You're going to talk different. You're going to look different. You might even smell different. There's going to be something about you that that people are going to notice. Because there's going to be a glory on you. Okay? They're just going to notice that. So these guys, they they were jealous of, of Daniel. And so they forced the, uh, the king to make an edict that if anybody showed allegiance other than to the king, he should be put to death. Okay? So, so now when Daniel, so we pick up the story. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, what writing? What I just said, when, they, when, when they, this edict went forth that anybody showed allegiance other than to the king, they should be put to death. So when he knew that the writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room, with his window open toward Jerusalem. See, he wasn't living in Jerusalem. He was living in Babylon. But he prayed and he longed for going back home to Babylon. And back back home to Jerusalem. So he would open his window toward Jerusalem. He knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed. And gave thanks before his God, as was his custom, that's an important word, as his custom was since early days. So he had been doing this for, since he was a young child. Probably, he, he learned that, I'm sure, when he was in Jerusalem before he was, he was exported out. And that was not a good thing. And so he learned that as a young child in his early days. So here was, here was Daniel. He heard, he saw that this handwriting, the, the edict went forth, 
But you know what? He did it anyway because he, he went and prayed anyway. He showed his allegiance to God, the Almighty God, Jehovah God. And these guys were sneaking around and they caught him in it. So that's a whole nother. They threw him in the lion's den. But you can go read that later. But here's the things I want you to pick up. There, there's, when you're praying, it's very important, I think, we use the example. He went to his upper room. And he did it three times a day. I think it's important that we have a specific time and a place. A specific time and a place. And the Bible says, I, I know the Bible says, you know, pray always. And, and, and that's important. But I think when you're, when you're devoting yourself to the Lord, I think it's important. Like in the morning, I like to do it in the morning. It's important to have a moment where you're devoting your time before the day really gets started to the Lord. Okay. I think it's important to have a specific time and place. I think it must be scheduled. Daniel apparently had a scheduled time. He did it three times a day. And I think it must be consistent. He did it daily, as his custom was since early days. And, and I think a good prayer to pray, as we see in Matthew chapter 6, is the Lord's Prayer. And our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, and so forth. And I think that's a, that's a good starting. And we have, we have uh, prayer guides for you in the, in the back of the foundations book that you have. There's a prayer guide on, on the Lord's Prayer that will help you. Okay, so those are just some prayer basics. Now, next one I want to talk about is the Word of God. How reading the Bible, the importance of reading the Bible. The Bible says in Psalms one nineteen one hundred five, "Your Word is a what? A lamp to my feet. It lights the path, and a light to my path." The Word of God, when we read it, it it explains things to us. It shows us the way, how to do things, how to live, how to talk, so forth. So it's, so it's so important. And why do we do it every day? To remind us. Because remember, like I said in the other lesson, that there is an enemy, there's another nature inside of you that wars against your spirit. And so every day you have to rest that nature and feed the new nature. So you're doing that when you're reading the word of God. And again, I think it's important using Daniel's, what he did, I think it's important to find uh, find a consistent, quiet place. Uh, and I think it's important to have a reading plan. I do the one-year Bible. Uh, a lot of people do a lot of other things. I've just been doing that since the, a long time, for 30-some years. Uh, I, I use the one-year Bible. And every day when I, when I there's, the Old, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a couple chapters in the Old Testament, and then some in the New, and then a psalm and a proverb, uh, and a, a part of a proverb. And so I do that every day. Use a simple reading plan. I think the Life Journal's great. Um, by Wayne Cadero, you can find that. Uh, the One Year Bible, uh, that's what I do. Or uversion.com, you go to uversion.com, which is incredible. Uh, you'll, find, you'll find more reading plans than you can imagine. You, you, you'll be so many options, you won't even know what to do. Just pick one, just pick one. So we got prayer, the word of God. And let me, let me help you and teach you a moment. How, how, do, you, how do you engage the word. There's, there's three ways, primary ways, is how we engage the word. I think, number one, we meditate on the word. And we see that in Joshua 1.8. When, when, when uh, it says the book of the law, God is telling Joshua, who, is, who took Moses' place, he said, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate it, meditate in it day and night. In other words, there's something to meditating on the word, not just reading the word, but actually getting it in you, meditating on the word. What does that mean? How did that mean? How does that affect me? How does it apply to my life? Uh, all the word of God applies to our life, but specifically for maybe that moment or whatever situation that you're in. I think it's important to meditate on the word, learn the word of God. Another thing is to med- is speak the word of God. Speak. The Bible says in Mark chapter 11, verse 22 and 23, that he says we should speak. Speak to the mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea. Not just praying to the mountain, but we actually speak. And what do we speak? We speak the promises of God. We speak the word of God to whatever, quote, mountain that is, whatever circumstance, whatever situation that you're going through, you speak the word. You could pray about it, but speak to the mountain. And, uh, and so then we speak, and I think it's important to memorize. I, I have scriptures that I memorized today. I, remember, I memorized them when I was a little kid. And so they're there. And so here's the thing. We want to we wanna hide the word in our heart now so in the future we'll be able to speak it out later. 
It's important. You hide the word in your heart, your heart now for whatever time in the future uh, that you might need it. So it's important because I know a lot of times when I'm dealing with a situation, I'm working with people, maybe in a counseling situation or, or whatever it is, and when I'm, when I'm talking to someone and they're telling me an issue, I'm asking the Lord, Lord, give me a scripture that can help settle this situation. There's not, and let me give you a tip. There's nothing that settles a situation more than the word of God. You can have your ideas, you can have your intellect, you can have your opinions, and that's all great and wonderful. You can have your education, which can help give you language to a certain, about something. But I'm telling you, when you pull out the scripture and you show it to someone where the Bible says this, it just kind of has a calming effect, a settling effect. So I'm always asking the Lord, give me a scripture for this situation. Very important. And I think that's, that, that is something, as you do this, you'll see how, how valid that point is. Okay, that's the word of God. Now, here's the one that everybody just loves, not, as the Bible says, when you fast. I don't know about you. I don't like to fast, okay, because I like to eat, particularly here in South Louisiana. It's so much fun, and it tastes so good, right? But there's times that we fast, when it's some of the most important decisions, I would say almost every important decision I've made in my life, huge, uh, I fasted. I fast and I pray. And what does that mean? I did without food for a, a sustained period. And I just did it for, 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 that, for, for those reasons, for whatever I was into. I, why? Because I wanted to quiet my soul. I wanted to quiet my mind so I can hear what God is telling me in a direction in this, whatever this situation is or was. I remember years ago when I was making the decision to, to go to Russia. Uh, that was a huge, that was a big deal. That was a big deal. And so I, I, I fasted and I prayed. And, and the Lord spoke to us in such a, an amazing fashion. It was just, just incredible. Even coming home. And so, so, you know, buying a house, getting married, that's a big one. You might want to fast a little bit on that one. You know, those are important life decisions. So when you come to these, whatever, if it's a business situation, some deal going down, whatever, separate yourself a little bit from food. Because it would quiet your soul where, so you can hear the voice of the Lord. Very, very important. And there was an expectation that the, that the early church would fast. He didn't say, uh, Jesus did not say, this is the words of Jesus. He's not saying if you fast. He says when you fast. Before Jesus, when he went on, before he was inaugurated on his, on his earthly, with his earthly ministry, he went on a 40-day fast right after he got water baptized. 40 days. He had no, no food. He drank water, but he, had, he didn't eat any food. Forty days. That's a long time. And I, I remember there were, this is crazy. You, you're going to laugh at this. But I did, I did a 21-day fast one time. Water only. And you see how skinny I am? I look like, I, I look like a zipper. Zip, I look like a zipper turned sideways with my tongue sticking out. I was so skinny. Yeah. But it was, there was a reason why I was doing it, and I did that. I'm not saying that to brag, but I've done all kinds. One day, three-day fast, seven-day fast, 14-day fast, and I, I've done all of those. I've done myriads. The older I've gotten, I've done more, uh, <laughs> more vegetable-type fasting. And, uh, but you can do all kinds. It's called a Daniel fast. There's all kinds of fasts you can do. And so I think it's important. So fasting, it's important to note this, is not a hunger strike. You're not going to go, I'm not going to eat God until you, you say something. No, it's not that. What fasting does, it's more about you than God. It's about quieting your own soul, positioning yourself in a place where you can hear from God. And it's amazing when your stomach goes quiet, how loud you can hear God's voice. It's just amazing. Okay. All right. So what is fasting? Okay, here's the, here's the rigorous def definition of fasting. It's the practice of abstaining from food for a given period of time in order to seek God in a greater way. Basically, if you want to, the, the, the strict, the, the strict uh, definition of fasting is turn your plate upside down. In simple paraphrase, that's my paraphrase. You turn your plate upside down. Arthur Wallace wrote a famous book years ago called God's Chosen Fast, and he said this, Fasting is a God-appointed means for the flowing of his grace and power that the church can't afford to neglect no longer. And I know people that are, that are 
quote, prayer warriors, and they fast and pray for our nation. They fast and pray for political leaders. I mean, that's, that's really wonderful. I just thank God for those people. Now, this next thing we see, the Bible says when you give, not if you give. And I want to take a moment and talk about what does it mean to give you know, or store up treasures in heaven? How do we store up treasures in heaven? It says here in Matthew chapter 6, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. No one can serve two masters. You cannot serve both God and money. This is a big one. This is a big one that a lot of people have problems with is giving to God. They simply maybe don't understand the precedent in the Bible for it. They don't understand how it, how, what it does in your own soul, how fulfilling it is to give. And, uh, and so, they, so a lot of people struggle with this, okay? Uh, here's a little axiom we say a lot around here. Money's a great tool, but it's a lousy God. And money in our society today is a God. It's a God. It's a religion, okay? And so we're going to talk a little bit about giving. The first biblical way we see in Scripture that we give is called the tithe. The tithe, which means tenth. So, and, and related to the tithe is the principle of the first. Because the tithe is, is 10% of the Bible says of your increase, we, whatever that is, we give back to God. So the Bible says here in Proverbs 3, 9, honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your what? Increase. And, you're, and you, there's a big broad definition of what that is. It means 10th or 10%. And we see in Malachi, he said, bring all the tithe into the storehouse. And there's blessings that go with that. And God even says, try me or test me with this and see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour it a blessing. So a lot of people over the years have asked me, I've taught this course for whew, a long time, probably 23 years now. And so uh, the question I get a lot of time, Pastor, do I tithe or not tithe? And, and, he, and so... <laughs> You know, where the economy is bad, I can't afford to tithe. Here's the thing, I always say that you can't afford not to tithe, okay? And I always go back to the scripture in Genesis. It says that Isaac, remember we talked about Isaac earlier. We had the two sons. His wife was Rebekah, Jacob, and Esau. So Isaac, the Bible says that Isaac dug wells in the land of famine and reaped, what? A hundredfold. So when there was a dearth, when there was a down, there was, there, there was a, a, a slowing of the economy, if you will, and there was a downturn, Isaac was still drilling wells. What was he doing? He was investing in God's kingdom. And he says, and the Bible says he reaped a hundredfold in the time of famine. Amazing. So when we tithe, I, this, I came up with this many years ago, a little acrostic here. Uh, that tithing is really trusting in the heavenly economy. Trusting in the heavenly economy. And because we can't trust Wall Street, right? Although it's, it's good to have investments. I have investments. People do it many different ways. They do it in the stock market, mutual funds, investing in houses. These are, these are things that they, they want to see increase their money to be increased by, by. There's nothing wrong with that. And when I pray for God's blessing, but I don't rely on that. I trust, I trust in the heavenly economy because, because the stock market is like a manic depressant. You never know one day it's up, one day it's down. You just never know what's going on. Okay, and so it's up and it's down, it's up and it's down. We hope it kind of goes up and to the right. That's always our prayer, right? But the best investment is the eternal investment. And so when we tithe, we're investing eternally. So we're entrusting in the heavenly kind that he's going to take care of all of our needs. I just know my wife and I, we've been tithing all of our married life. We, tithe, we both tithe before we ever were married. And I've tithed as a Christian, as a single and so we've been, we're, we're just, because, why? Because we love God. We want to be, be obedient to the scripture. And we see God, we've seen God's blessing on our life. He will make your car run longer and last longer. I can verify that. He will make things last longer in your household. <laughs> this, you're going to laugh at this, but we have, we've had a washer and dryer in our house since we were married 35 years ago. And it still works. It's a Maytag, by the way. Anyway, so trusting, we're trusting in the heavenly economy. So uh, another question I've gotten over the years, well, Pastor Randy, do I tithe on the gross, my gross income or do I tithe on my net income? Do I, is it gross or net? And 
a lot of kids, a lot of younger people nowadays, they don't even know the difference between what gross and net is, so we have to educate them a little bit. And so uh, we tithe on the gross because that's our total increase. And the way I like to say it, when you got a job and you got an offer letter, did they tell you what your gross income was going to be or did they tell you what your net income was going to be? No, they told you what your gross income is going to be, right? Whatever, I'm just going to make this up. You're making $100,000 a year. And I'm not going to say, oh, you take the taxes out, you take out for FICA and Social Security and all these different things, you know, and now this is your net and this is what you're going to make. No, they don't tell you that. They're going to tell you this is your gross income. That's your increase. That's, that's what you make, okay? And then Uncle Sam takes, the, takes his part, okay? So, we, we, but we tithe on the gross because that's our increase. And so here's the acrostic for that. Because it's, it's the right thing to do. Tithing on the gross is the right thing. God rightly obeyed, supplies supernaturally. God rightly obeyed, supplies supernaturally. So if you obey, obey God on your increase, he's going to supply supernaturally. That's why people say, people say, I just can't afford to tithe, Pastor Randy. You can't afford not to tithe. Okay. And so then, uh, so they ask me, so when you're tithing on the net, not everything's tithed. <laughs> That's just honestly God truth. And so what's our increase? It could be maybe you sold a property and had an increase on that. Maybe you got a bonus or an inheritance or all, all these different things, you know. Maybe your house increased in value. And, and so th- those are just things that are increased that you just have to just kind of work through and kind of figure that out. But anyway, the, the basic one is our, our monthly paycheck or a weekly paycheck or whatever, the gross versus the net. And so... Uh, not, net means not everything tied. Okay. The second biblical way that we see to give, so the first was the tithe. The second biblical way is the offering. There's, we see there's two, two ways to giving in the Bible. There's, there's the tithe, and which is, and the Bible says we return, the tithe is not ours. The Bible says we return the tithe to the Lord. It's all his. It's all his anyway. But we're returning a portion of that, this, just a portion of that back to God. God. Why? Because we're, we're so grateful and thankful. And so it's our, it's our duty. It's what, we, it's what we're supposed to do. The offering is anything over and above the tithe. We've, so we do that. But then if the other part is out of the 90% that's left, if you want to give an offering to a TV ministry or, or whatever, uh, uh, water, digging water wells in Africa, uh, just many different th- things that are out there, excuse me, so we see here that in, the, in, this, in Scripture, there's three basic places to tithe. We have give to missions. You'll see this in, Act, in, in the book of Acts particularly. People gave offerings to the Apostle Paul when he was going to different places on his missionary journeys. Uh, there was always giving to the poor. Okay, And then there was the giving, the building to the temple, what, you know, building projects that the church had. Uh, back in the day. And you can see this particularly in, well, in, in a lot of different places. They were doing this. Uh, people would give offerings to the building of the temple. So I hope that helps. And so these are the devotional practices. Uh, there's prayer. There's reading the word of God and, and uh, the giving and fasting. So these are just four basic principles of showing our devotion and our eternal connection with God. So I hope that helps and I will connect with you again in lesson six. And I'm so excited about that. And we'll see you shortly. Keep doing your foundations book. Keep getting into scripture. And and God is going to just reveal some incredible things to you. So God bless. We'll see you later.